from the 101st Airborne Infantry, the Screaming Eagle Division. The Army Navy Screen Magazine have asked me to sit in on a film they're making about uh, Stone. I guess I'm supposed to tell you what it was like up there in Belgium during the big German winter offensive, their last offensive of this war. Uh, as small as the Bastogne pocket was, it's impossible for a guy like me to tell you the entire story. And the films we have just aren't enough. You see, the cameramen were so busy at the time, banging away with their carbines and their M1s, that they just couldn't film everything. But anyhow, let's have a look at it. Okay, let it go. We moved into it from a rest area in France, where we were getting re-equipped after a long campaign up in Holland. I think the code orders to Brigadier General Tony McCall, that's him, were something like, get the Screaming Eagles to Merry Christmas. I don't have to tell you how it feels to get tossed out of a nice warm sack. They used to some of the equipment we'd need for a combat jump, but no parachutes. When they didn't give us the canopies, we knew we were tagged for something special. And brother, we were. That very same afternoon, they loaded us into the six by sixes. After the kidding stopped, we began to wonder where we were going. Some of the boys had it, that we were going to be landed in Norway, or be moved back to the States, or a jump on Japan. All that night, our parents polished those hard wooden seats. Then, we heard the straight dope, about the breakthrough. How von Rundstedt's December counteroffensive had broken through the Ardennes front for 75 miles from Aachen to the Saar. Heard Merry Christmas on headquarters map was Bastogne, inside the bulge. Bastogne, the road hub. As long as we could hold on to Bastogne, we could screw up the German offensive. That was the angle. First, we moved the Belgians back. No sense them getting hurt. They were a lot like the farmers I knew upstate in Pennsylvania. It was pretty tough to move these people back just before Christmas, after they'd been liberated once. But Christmas around Bastogne didn't look too cheerful for us either. We didn't know who was friend or enemy. Some Germans were wearing our uniforms. So we had to search everyone. Then we really got a jab. It became a white Christmas. Most of us had left our overcoats back in the rest area. We didn't even warm up when the battle started, and it was hot. Lots of fellows got it right away. See that guy? Bobby Leaking. With his M1 and two grenades, he knocked out a machine gun position and a jerry patrol. And after he caught a pack of slugs in his leg, he took care of a burp gunner. That's the way it was, all around the rim the week before Christmas. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. We lost damn near everything. Our quartermaster unit, our ordnance, tanks, trucks, and more important, a lot of good guys. The casualty list in some platoons sound like the roll call. They froze in the snow where they got it. Culbert, Harmon, Heitzman, McGregor, Newton, Parks, Merritt, a lot of good men. But our one division was holding off eight full German divisions. Yet no matter how tough things get, there are always some G.I. who can make with the humor. A couple of them dreamed up a title for us. The Battered Bastards of the Bastion of Bastogne. And we laughed and kept hammering away with what little ammo we had left. Then on Friday, Black Friday, the Germans made one of their biggest mistakes. They sent us an ultimatum. Surrender or be annihilated by artillery. Two hours to answer. General McAuliffe answered with one four-letter word. He wrote to the German commander, nuts. One of the boys had to explain the meaning to the crowd commandant. He stated it was just GI American or go to hell. The crowds answered our four-letter word with one of their own. Fire. They poured it on. 88s and screaming memes. So we hung on to Bastogne, sweating out an ammo shortage, knowing our only break could be an airborne resupply mission. But the overcast was so thick, a troop carrier plane couldn't get through with a snowplow. Let me tell you, we really sweated. With no weather break expected until New Year's Eve, more than a week away. Hell, by that time, we'd be throwing snowballs at Cherry.
All we could do was hold on and pray. And we prayed. We prayed for a sunrise. We prayed for the skies to open. And on Saturday morning, the day before Christmas Eve, the sun came up. The most terrific sunrise of the war. And in the sunlight were the C-47 sky trains. Sky full of Douglas Dakotas and Waco gliders as far as you could see. Hug to Herman no motor. Goodbye, Herman. Okay, Flash. So long. Look at them. The guys of the 9th Troop Carrier Command, barreling right through the flak and ground power. Coming in so low over the German lines, we started joking about giving them combat infantry badges to wear over their wings. Jerry is pushing up plenty of flak, and there are plenty of flamers. Yet those hot rocks keep coming in, without armor or fighter cover. From the bellies of the steel geese pour the ammo, the rations, the guns, the shells, and all the other stuff we need for our fight. gliders, more supplies, and medics, surgical teams. Those glider pilots, brother, they're the guts and glory boys. After bringing in their glue and fabric crates, they jumped out, grabbed guns, and got in the line with the rest of us for the 1,500 tons of stuff the 9th Troop Carrier Command brought us in time for Christmas. So Christmas Eve, we tossed a party. We let the crowds come in close, let them think their tanks had cleared the way. Then we opened up. It was really a surprise party. You can hear them hollering, comrade, begging for mercy, asking for a break. Oh, sure. We gave them a break, the kind they've been giving everybody else. We broke them all the way down. And when we nailed them wearing civilian and GI clothes, we took good care of them, too. The German supermen, they didn't know what the hell had happened. They thought they had us hold in, but the hole turned inside out. Their great counteroffensive wound up inside our prisoner of war cages. That was the way the Battle of Bastogne ended in the last German offensive of the war. After the 4th Armored rolled in, we began to attack. A month later, the mission was completed, and we screaming eagles marched out. As you know, we got a presidential station. The citation. These units distinguished themselves in combat against powerful and aggressive enemy forces composed of elements of eight German divisions during the period of 18th December to 27th December 1944 by extraordinary heroism and gallantry in defense of the key communication center of Bastogne, Belgium. When General Eisenhower pinned a picture frame on us, I was thinking about the other guys who came to Bastogne. And I'm sure that most of the other troopers in the 101st were thinking the same thing. Now this isn't official, through channels, but I've asked the Army Navy Screen Magazine to show you their pictures. Here are the guys who saved our torn and tattered airborne backs. The hot rocks of the night troop carrymen. That's Major General Paul L. Williams. He's the commanding general. The outfit has carried every airborne show in the ETO. Pilots, co-pilots, and navigators, like Colonel Joe Crouch, Scott, Montgomery, Hines, Berman. Crew chiefs and radio operators, Adler, Reynolds, McJunkin, Martin, and the glider pilots, those are my boys, Simpson, Oliver, and Connors. If you ever run into any of these ninth troop carrier guys, buy them a drink for the Screaming Eagle. They really paid for it at Bastogne in the battle in which we all fought. It was plenty rugged. 